uh, sort of see all of you. Um, and uh, uh, so I just have a few a few thoughts. I'm mostly interested in the discussion, so I'll try to go through what I have to say um, a bit fast. So, uh, Oriane, thanks to Oriane and um, uh, Scientist Rebellion for organizing this. Um, and there are more talks the rest of the week, so I really hope that this is a longer discussion. So I guess I just want to say a few words. So why basically one of the, you know, I came to activism and I came to science in different directions. I was doing it both, but why do them together? So why do both need each other in the case of uh, the climate and ecological emergency? And I think that there's the role of activism in supporting research, which is one, and also the role of research in strengthening activism, which is another. And I think that the, the two elements are both interesting and both deserve our attention. Um, I think it matters how we understand change and especially social change. There's different types of activism. I probably won't talk too much about that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more actually about uh, some other things that sort of came to my mind uh, around specific actions we can take and specific strategies we can follow as, um, as uh, researchers in this area. So I guess the first thing I just wanna share here is that I think that you know we, we, we sort of have uh, this is sort of something I came up with in the early hours of the morning after not being able to sleep very much, but that, that we have um, we have sort of on the left hand side, you can see the physical and natural physical natural science technological or engineering understanding of how things might uh, what what are what are what is the problems surrounding us and how we might change them. We also have the social economic cultural and political spheres on the right hand side and the two of them really sort of lead us on um, parallel but not the same trajectories. And one of the things that I think we have to understand is we have to understand the root causes of our physical and natural problems in our social, economic, and political structures. And that makes the research quite interesting and interdisciplinary. And it also means that we can't resolve climate and ecological crises just with um, uh, just on, only by looking at one or the other. So. Uh, why do we need activism? Um, so this is this is sort of how I was brought up, and I think still a lot of uh, a lot of us are brought up. So the, there's an ideal scientific view of how change happens, sort of comes from the Enlightenment, maybe. Uh, so it's a technocratic change process. So it's a technocratic uh, worldview. You have a scientist saying, "My great research result indicates we should change our policies," and not this scientist is being extra good because not only are they writing a, a great papers and doing great research as you can see on their computer but they also went to the trouble of writing a policy brief which basically explains in simple short language to a policymaker um, how and why we need change and here we have an idealized policymaker uh, you know saying i've read the brief and i agree so i will now work with my colleagues to change policy so we sort of have this view that information changes the world and of course uh, the closer you get to things the, the the less you understand that that's how things happen and you you have we have to understand you know we have to sort of if we want to change how what politicians are doing we also have to understand their constraints that they're facing and i sort of mapped out in a very cartoon form the strong you know what the constraints are politicians facing there's strong forces in society prominent industries, lobby groups, uh, you know, just going cl clockwise, there's media representation of debates is extremely important. If you are intervening with a, with a proposal that doesn't fit with the media representation, your proposal will not be viable for that politician. There's political party factions, political party positions. Can that politician take a position against their own party platform? Probably not. There's the focus of local voters, which is something else yet. There's the things that this politician actually cares about. Most politicians actually have things that they really care about in their ambitions. How does this topic fit with them? And I might give you an example of one way, uh, surprising ways in which if you care about the things that your local politicians care about as well, then if you learn about them, you can, you can help uh, see them how these things fit together. There are issues of social class position in society. There is a whole schedule and process around lawmaking, ministries, budget schedules, whatever. And then, of course, uh, the scientist with the good idea is a very, very small, far away creature, right, in this in the scheme of things. And moreover, you also have this, this aspect where the strong forces in society, uh, for instance, the, the fossil fuel industry and its friends, will be funding climate denial and getting quite a bit of 
um, influence in terms of media representation and debates. So we know that they've been doing this since the 1980s with great success. So they have a lot of advance in terms of their strategic and their effectiveness on uh, a lot of head start on us. And um, also they get subsidies. They're very good at using uh, government processes for, for their purposes in terms of getting uh, subsidies, budgets, et cetera. So, um, so obviously we're in a, in a not very ideal situation and that's the situation that we very much live in. Um, and uh, there are a few examples here. I don't want to go into detail on them, but for instance, in the UK where, where I used to work, you know, the BBC only stopped requiring, they actually had a policy saying you have to have a climate denier on air for balance in 2018 and they still keep doing it regardless. Um, the, the UK budget at the time included 30 billion for road building and nothing for renewable energy, despite the fact that they declared uh, climate emergency. Um, you know, the, the Swiss CO2 law recently had loop, but that was that failed, uh, but had loopholes within loopholes. Um, anyway, so, so, so you, you, we, we see that we are in a, uh, a situation where even though climate science and the emergency of climate change is well established, nothing is really changing. So there's a lot of um, um, fixed momentum and rigidity in the system. So why does that mean that, how does that mean that we need activism? So I guess the, one of the conclusions for me and maybe for lots of other people was that good science is not enough. We need activism and the goal of activism is to give the necessity for social change a bigger voice. So basically you can still have a scientist and you know, even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other scientific groups writing these reports and the reports are actually being read more by the activists than by the policymakers. So the activists are taking the scientific evidence and basically acting like a giant, uh, very effective megaphone to put sufficient pressure onto politicians. So to use their position as a mass movement to put sufficient pressure on politicians to finally maybe change some things, uh, even though that might not be yet enough. So that's sort of one, one view of how activism helps science is that activists take science seriously, a lot more seriously than um, other, some other people you might hope would take it seriously. Um, and this makes it interesting from a scientific perspective to understand activism. So this is where the, the other aspect comes in of how does research how can research help us understand what kinds of activism exist and what they consist on and um, are they effective or not? And so here I just have like a schematic of some sort of uh, uh, broad types of activism. One of the things that's maybe interesting is that each of them will be based on a theory of social change, which can be articulated, will be articulated in books and articles. Um, and they, they sort of have trade-offs, they have pros and cons. I don't wanna go into detail here, but, um, and they might also have more and less effectiveness. So if you're just a member of Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, WWF, et cetera, that's great, but it's, it's, um, um, it's easy to do, everyone can do it, but it might not be very effective, very transformative. Um, these organizations tend to be risk averse and push for more incremental goals, for instance. Whereas on the other side of things, the nonviolent uh, civil disobedience, youth strikes, extinction rebellion um, are uh, highly visible, resonate with the public, whether positively or negatively, but they change the debate. However, they're high risk, uh, have personal, involve personal sacrifice and are disruptive. And they have their theory of changes around popular mobilization or movements. And if you work in sustainability, you've probably seen um, some some version of this uh, of this diagram from Danella Meadows. Um, so Danella Meadows wrote about leverage points. She was a system systems thinker, um, probably the most famous uh, systems thinker, or one of them. Um, and she wrote this really beautiful paper called Leverage Points: How to Intervene in a System, which a lot of people refer back to because it's great. And she talks about how you have more shallow. If you're trying to change a system, you have different types of intervention, and she sort of ranked them by more shallow and with they might be easier to change but have less transformative power and they're down here and deeper leverage points have greater potential but are under researched and also harder to activate and i would say along the shallow uh <laughs> leverage points you know your standard university um policy brief would sort of be on the very shallow end it's not going to change things as much 
maybe structure-based organizing, members, membership organizations, which is what Saul Alinsky Rules for Radicals was based upon, is sort of in the middle, and maybe nonviolent uh, civil, um, civil resistance, as described in Engler and Engler, is, has much stronger potential, uh, but then it, again, is, is, is harder to do. Um, so I would like to make the case for nonviolent civil disobedience. This is something that um, I, uh, I mean, I've, I've learned about and also to some extent do. I think, um, so basically the idea is that profound change against powerful entrenched forces requires a strong countering force. And they have this notion of social coercion. Um, we need, so we need to change the way things are going. We need to be a powerful, that's not gonna happen through polite conversation, right? So it needs some kind of a force on the other side in order to change the way things are currently going. People power can't compete in terms of military police or economic force, and that's true for, for, for us as well. We don't have that kind of power, but we can still win if we're clever. So popular movements, um, the study of popular movements and how they can win and be successful or fail, uh, you know, learning from popular movements is actually quite neglected um, in political science. So there's not a lot of scholarship uh, and hopefully that's something that can still change, but we, we have to learn from what there is. And some of the main um, contributions in terms of explaining the theory of it and learning from experience are from the most famous, some of the most famous practitioners like Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Judy Barry from Earth First, and then a few researchers that are cited in this book as well. Um, so there are historical examples of success, some more successful than others um, the, that are gone over in this book. So I, I recommend it. I, I personally learned a lot from it. So I, and it's written in a very sort of academic way in terms of explaining commonalities and so on. Um, in terms of the lessons from success, I think this is sort of an important thing to, to start from. So uh, this idea of civil resistance, so it often runs counter to established organizations. It runs counter to political parties and unions. So you're basically not making friends necessarily within established organizations, uh, but your, 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 your effects will change them. So that's one of the things, there's sort of a tension there that one has to navigate. Um, you have to have some kind of decentralized but principled way of running your organization. There's a strong role of training and there's a strong role of discipline for nonviolence. Um, so you have to focus on disruption. So you have to have a strategic uprising. You have to have campaigns um, organized around actions. There's an importance of escalation of constantly gaining momentum based on what happens around you. And you have to do that. You can do that in a planned way, but also you have to spontaneously take advantage you know, of what's happening around. Um, you have to address pillars of the establishment so that the whole can crumble. Uh, that's something that's uh, widely, widely considered. Um, there's an art in balancing decentralized organizing and the goals of the whole movement. And also you have to consider that you have an outsider role and collaboration with allies within the pillars. So each of the pillars of the establishment, you will have people there who want to work with you, who want to listen to you. And there's sort of a tension to navigate again then. You really want to work with them, but you can't be limited by their demands on you. And in the end, uh, you have to shift the, shift the debate to your own terms, which means that polarization is good. So the fact that something is divisive or polarizing actually forces the debate and discussion. So maybe that person, that activist, that organization becomes unpopular, but because they force the discussion, they have a really huge effect and you can see that happen. And um, it also makes sure that the topic is kept visible in media. Uh, there's a real role of creativity and culture here. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about the, the, the because I've been part of these, um, of some of these nonviolent civil disobedience movements and actions, I just wanted to share a few thoughts um, about limits of appeal to power as a tactic. So this is me at the Declaration of Rebellion uh, outside Westminster in London. Um, uh, I almost got arrested, but then things got confusing and I didn't. Um, and so, you know, that's an appeal to power. We were outside Westminster. We had a huge demonstration. It wasn't permitted. We spilled out onto the street, but we were appealing to power. We were there to demand that parliament tell the truth about the climate crisis and act as though the crisis is real, right? Those are the demands of Extinction Rebellion. And um, that's also what Greta Thunberg did, right? Greta Thunberg uh, sat outside par Swedish parliament. So it's an appeal to power because she's outside parliaments and de demanding that power, the parliamentarians address climate change. 
Um, and I would say that this tactic, since it's been going on for now two and a half years at least, has basically failed. So it was justified and powerful in its own way. So governments listened. A lot of cases they passed climate emergency declarations. Climate rose to the on the to the top of the agenda, you know, even in the US presidential election. But I would say this is still very superficial in terms of the fundamental needs um, that we have, which are for emissions to come down. And so uh, I would say that the result is yet more inaction now with a glossy clever of we sort of care. And you can see that even in their net zero pledges, the, which are not even put into policy, um, the governments who don't get us to zero at all. So the, 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 and, and in terms of the commitments, you know, the UNDC, the NDC commitments uh, um, at that time in February, there was a new new round where countries sort of can't gave new commitments. And they, the, the, what they amounted to was a reduction of 1% in greenhouse gases by 2030. So this is obviously completely insufficient. So there's sort of a, a lots of talk, very little action. And I think that appealing to power has sort of, uh, we've given, you know, we've given them a chance, but it's not working. So what alternatives exist to appealing to power? Um, I think that uh, this book, uh, We Make Our Own History, uh, which is about Marxism and social movements in the twilight of neoliberalism is really interesting because they put forward a new social theory. Uh, so don't be put out by the, the Marxist thing. They're not very dogmatic um, in their own way. They're much more creative than that, these two authors. But they basically say they're social movements from below, which would be us climate activist popular movements and from above. So we have to understand that we're up against other social movements. So powerful forces are not just structures, they're people, they have alliances, they have their own campaigns and goals and so on. And we need to learn how to disrupt their movements. So it's a much more sort of, that when you look at it that way, the battle becomes quite, um, you can think of it differently. Uh, and different tactics can be effective, like confronting power, exposing power, delegitimizing power and replacing power. So one of the things I would argue is that um, we can, our movements can cease to appeal to governments, but expose their lack of legitimacy. So a government that does not act effectively on climate change and really reduce emissions right now is questionable whether or not that government has legitimacy in terms of its responsibility to its population. So that's what um, I would say. And I think that it's interesting to think in that direction. So how can, from understanding to action, um, so I would I argue that the urgency of the climate situation does not allow for gradualistic transitions either in research or in reality. Uh, we really need radical transformation and we're still probably not going to be to, to get where we want to get. Um, I would say that popular movements realize this, but I don't think that our research is supporting these popular movements enough. And I have a question for all of us, which is how can we contribute? How can we participate? How, we can, how can we support them more? Um, so with some colleagues, we recently, just in the last um, few weeks, uh, this article was published from publications to public actions. I'd like to talk more about that in the question and answer series maybe, um, where we, we say what we think the universities should be doing. So how do we change what the university is in terms of facing, you know, probably the largest crisis uh, that humanity has ever, has ever faced and in a very uh, urgent way. So how do we transform our work and the way we do it in order to, to really be, a, uh, to play an, a positive role here? Specific recommendations. Um, I just want to give some examples of scientific support for activism. So I hope that many of you were part of the 26,000 scientists who signed a letter of support for young activists. Uh, that was um, in April 2019, so already two years ago. Um, then uh, this was when, this was also 2019, but October, this was the October rebellion. Uh, scientists endorsed mass civil disobedience to force climate action. And this was, this was published by Reuters and it was really widely read and it really made a, a big difference in how things were, were perceived. So that's having climate and environmental scientists um, say that civil disobedience was legitimate, uh, was, was quite interesting. And this is a picture of me. Um, and that's another thing you need to learn is that that's probably the picture of me that most people have seen. So you don't always get to look as flattering as you want. It was a cold day, it was raining, it was a horrible day to be standing outside, but we did it. And, um, and so it was important, it was an important thing to do. And you can see this, my friend's slide, who's, uh, who got his uh, beautiful GDP versus CO2 emissions curve, um, his, his sign is all like getting wet and soggy and so on, but it survived the demonstration. Um, 
And more recently, uh, this was a letter that I co-wrote, so as opposed to just signing it, uh, where we noticed that quite a bit of us, no a few of us noticed that um, climate uh, activism was being criminalized around the world. So in the UK and the US, uh, new laws being passed in India, new laws being passed to um, threaten nonviolent civil disobedience. And so we wrote a letter in support and got a 400 climate and environmental scientist, or more than 400 climate and environmental scientists to sign that. And I think that that was quite important because it's saying, listen, we're, we, uh, we actually said in the letter, we understand that the reason that climate is top of the agenda is not thanks to our work. It's not thanks to policymakers. It's because of the activists and they're standing for us and we will stand with them. And we really object to the fact that, you know, governments around the world first said, um, oh, we can't possibly listen to you scientists because climate is not a popular issue. And then when there's thousands and thousands of young people on the street, they're like, right, let's just arrest and jail them <laughs> and criminalize them. You can't, you know, that it's, it's, uh, that's not, that's certainly not fair. Um, and I think that we also have to think about a context of far right attacks on academic freedom and teaching and activism, especially on the economics and uh, criticism of capitalism aspects. So um, in 2019, in July 2019, there was this uh, think tank called, well, think tank, they're really horrible, a policy exchange. They're a far right, uh, really a sort of extreme think tank um, that really is very coupled to the UK uh, conservative government. So the conservative government, somebody will say like, I think the way it works is they say, oh, I'd really like to pass this kind of law. And then policy exchange goes and writes a policy brief saying, oh, you have to pass this kind of law. And then they're like, oh, okay, we'll do it. And in this case, policy exchange was advocating the criminalization of uh, Extinction Rebellion as terrorists. Um, they were calling them extremists. They were saying they will be violent, even if they're nonviolent now, they will be violent. So just, just criminalize them right now before they even have a chance. And uh, they were criticizing the fact that it was anti-capitalist and anti-growth. And that was something where we came back as academics. If you look at the piece, we say, actually, there's a lot of good evidence to be critical of capitalism and critical of growth. This is not an anti-intellectual position. In fact, the reverse, if you don't allow criticism of our current economic system, it's really, you're really going against the evidence. And uh, sure enough, uh, about a year later, the UK policy is now schools in England are told not to use material from anti-capitalist groups. What's interesting here, of course, is that the Labour Party in the UK is still the second largest party, um, up until very recently was overtly, you know, anti-capitalist. That was part of their that was part of their platform. But no, now this is an extreme perspective. And uh, just um, at the end of last week, uh, no, a month ago, Biden's anti-terrorism initiative um, uh, includes, you know, I, lots of things against violent extremists and check it out. Uh, anarchist violent extremists are people who oppose all forms of capitalism, globalization. And, uh, and so, you know, here we are again, where you have a criticism of the economy um, and tie, you know, if you tie the, 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 the form of the economy that we're in to the problems that we're facing, then all of a sudden we're violent extremists and we shouldn't be allowed to say these things. So I think this is really dangerous and something that we should pay a lot of attention to. Uh, and I'm hoping we can discuss that. So what should we do? Um, so I think we should do activism as researchers, yes, but what else? So after the disappointing Loi CO2, which was disappointing in itself, and the terrible no vote, what, what should we do, right? What Time for something new. Uh, so I would, I would argue for a couple of things. One is talking to party platforms about not making climate policy about taxation and redistribution, but really about a new, a really radically new program for the future that includes social, environmental, uh, and economic change. So I think we really need to give people a, a dramatic new vision, like something around the Green New Deal for Switzerland, something like that. I think that that's really important. Another thing I would really push forward, and people here are already working on it to some extent, like Sasha and Nick, is this idea of a citizens' assembly. And I think a lot of the climate scientists are coming around to this thing, to, to this, to this um, process, as allowing us to go faster than our normal democ. That a, it's a direct democracy uh, process, which allows us to go faster than our current form of di uh, direct democracy, and to allow for something transformative to come out. Um, another thing I would like to see in Switzerland or more broadly in Europe maybe, 
is this idea of uh, the clim the, the, this climate crisis advisory group. So this was just launched in the UK uh, last Friday. Um, its first meeting will be this Thursday. Um, and the idea here is that um, this the idea of the independent sage. It's a UK thing, but basically they were a group of independent scientists, medical scientists and epidemiologists who criticized the government openly on weekly uh, or twice a week meetings that they broadcast on YouTube. And they were really critical of the government's policy, COVID policies, letting lots of people die. And this made a big difference. And they, they were able to basically pressure the government to not be quite as terrible. And so the idea to do, would be to do this kind of thing for climate. And maybe we can talk more about what that could look like. And if anybody is interested in trying to get something like that off the ground here. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much.